Yeah. We're back. We're live. <clears throat> We're doing Community Matters with Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, the leader of Chabad of Hawaii. And it's very important that we have him here so we can understand, that we can develop a, a depth of understanding about, about Chabad and about the Jewish religion and about the holidays. And, and have some loving kindness in the process, Rabbi. Thank you for coming. Hey, thank you for inviting me. As always, it's a pleasure to be here. So we entitled this Purim Reconsidered because you have to consider Purim again and again. There are layers and levels of Purim. We talked about uh, exactly what's in the Megillah and uh, the story of Esther and Haman and Achishveros and, and um, Mordecai. Um, in fact, I saw something in, the, in the, one of the Jewish newspapers a couple okay. of days ago about the, you know, the, the special relationship between the two queens the two queens. Queen Esther and Queen Vashti? Yeah. And, okay. uh, you know, I mean, it's an exam, a psychological examination of how things must have gone between the two of them. They were not friends, I would say, no? Well, actually, uh, Esther, the Jewish queen, were, entered onto the scene after the first queen was beheaded by her husband. So uh, she must have, she heard of her. That's not done anymore. Well, not in done Iran, in that part of the world. Maybe it's still done in Iran, yeah. <laughs> it's the same so, country. <laughs> so let me just tell you an interesting tidbit that hopefully will start the conversation. In the Megillah, the scroll, the Book of Esther, there's, uh, when things turned around and a great miracle happened and Esther pleaded for the Jewish people and Ahasuerus, the king, granted her wish that the Jewish people could defend themselves after, uh, from uh, any attack. And Haman was uh, f uh, put to death. It says that Haman was hung on the, on the very same tree that he uh, wanted Mordechai to be hung from. And all of his ten children were also killed and hung. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The Talmud says mm -hmm. that um, there actually was an 11th child. Haman had an 11th child. She was a young girl at the time, and she saw the turn of events, how things started going against her father, and she couldn't bear it. She committed suicide. So there were only 10 left. Oh. That's what the Talmud says. Now, fast forward. Uh, in 1946, there were the Nuremberg trials. Or uh, the Nazis were put on, those who were captured were put on trial. Do you know about that movie? The what? story of Ben Ferenz? No, nothing. He was, he was the uh, prosecutor. Okay. And it played at the Jewish Film Festival last week at the, oh, at the wow. museum. And it's actually, believe it or not, this is actually on, where is it? It's on Amazon now. Or possibly on uh, Netflix now. <clears throat> for a few bucks, you can watch this wonderful movie. It's a documentary. Wow. And it's about the Nuremberg Trials. It's about Ben Ferenz, who is, last week he was 99 years wow. old. Wow. And wow. what a man. Just, I don't okay. want to digress too much, but so, this is a yeah. man who comes to his, to his family every evening at, at dinner time, and he asks them the same question every evening for his whole life, the life of his family. He asks them this question. What have you done to make the world better? Wow. That's what a man. What a, yeah. Anyway, wow. sorry I interrupted. No, 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 thank you. That's a beautiful. So, an interesting tidbit. So, in the Nuremberg trials, there were 11 Nazis, high ranking Nazi officials, that uh, went on trial. And all 11 of them where uh, the verdict was death by hanging. Um, the 11th person was Goring, the famous Nazi general Goring. The morning when they were all let out to be hung, uh, when they entered the cell of Goring, they found him dead. He, he committed suicide. So there were no 11 Nazis hung. Now there were ten. There were ten. And when this gentleman, his name was Julius, Julius Streicher, he was the Nazi propaganda chief. 
when he was sent to the gallows, his last words was, he cried out, he shouted out, Purim fest. Oh, Purim fest. He knew the comparison. One second, this gets more interesting. His private estate was turned into a transitory camp for survivors as they were taken uh, away from Europe and Germany, Israel, or other places. So many Jewish people stayed there, uh, survivors of the camps. They found in his house uh, a Bible that he had that he underlined everywhere in the Bible where it talked about um, Haman, the, the whole book of Esther, he had his comments. And it turns out he believed that the origins of the Aryan race were in Persia, from Persia. Very interesting. So, and we're not t talking about the Mordecai and Esther side of the equation either, are exactly. we? Exactly, no. So, we're, so this is like part of this whole big jigsaw puzzle many centuries after the story of Purim, where 11, 11 uh, Nazis were, uh, were uh, convicted. convicted to be hung. 10, in fact, were because one committed suicide. And then if you press replay, that was the exact same thing happened at Haman, where 11 were going to be hung, but only 10, in fact, were because the 11th one was, uh, was uh, committed suicide. So that's, so that's very, very fascinating. We're going to take a short break. We're going to answer that call. <laughs> Who knows where that call came from? <laughs> it's Rabbi Itchel Krasinchansky of Chabad of Hawaii, and the title of our show is um, Purim Reconsidered. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at three, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Rabbi Itchel Krasinjansky talking about Purim. Purim reconsidered, finding new levels and layers and interpretations and remarkable mystical things about Purim. Yeah. So I, I told you that back in 1978, uh, I went to Israel, and um, I, my, my brother and my wife and I, we, we stumbled into um, a synagogue there in Tel Aviv, and it was Purim, oh, wow. and they were reading the, the Megillah, and it was, I've never seen this before, and I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in New York. Ah. I'd never seen this before. People were... The, the whole, the, the, whole, the whole congregation was there. It was so crowded and tumultuous. It was like a Bruegel painting. Everybody animated, and uh, they were reading the Megillah, and, and the kids were doing with the noisemakers, and people were singing and chanting and making fun. It was such a fun holiday, really. Yeah, uh, Purim is a very, very fun holiday. It's a joyous and fun holiday, especially for the kids. The whole plot of Purim is that everything... Was, was shrouded in mystery. Uh, in fact, our, the sages tell us that Esther, the, uh, the name of the Jewish queen Esther, uh, in Hebrew has the, the root of the word Esther is hester, to conceal. Where God says in the Bible, where in the exile, God says, I will conceal my face. Esther concealed her identity to uh, the king. When she first went into the king's palace, she didn't 
revealed that she was Jewish. Why? Well, because Mordechai, uh, her uncle, the, 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 judge. Her, the Jewish leader who was the head of the su Jewish Supreme Court, uh, he told her not to reveal her identity because he perhaps sensed that, um, that uh, she would be able to use it in a useful way at the right time for her to, to reveal her identity, which is in fact what happened. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole story of the Megillah takes place over a very long period of time, maybe a 20-year period. So from when the king, Ahasuerus, becomes king and uh, until the whole story unfolds. The opening of the Megillah um, uh, opens up with Ahasuerus throwing a big, big feast at the third year from when he was king. Uh, our sages tell us that the reason why he um, threw this big feast was he wanted to celebrate um, a victory of sorts, and that is there was a prophecy by Jeremiah that after uh, the whole story of Purim takes place, after the destruction of the first temple when the Jews were exiled into Babylon, Babylonia. So there was a, a, a prophecy by Jeremiah that it would, in 70 years, the Jews would be called back to Israel. The exile would be only for 70 years. And the kings and the rulers were very, very um, cognizant of that prophecy and were afraid that if, if that's what happens in the Jews, it would be a brain drain mm. uh, of, the, of the Jews in that, uh, in that, in that country. So Ahasuerus watched it very closely, and when the 70-year uh, day came, or the year came, and nothing happened, Ahasuerus uh, was relieved and felt that, okay, well, if it didn't, if it didn't happen, then the prophecy probably is not going to happen, and it's not true, so he can be more confident in his reign. Uh, as the Talmud says, little did he realize that he miscalculated the 70 years. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, <clears throat> so it opens up with uh, Ahasuerus throwing the party. And then in, in the story of the party is that he invites his queen, his wife Vashti, to parade herself in front of, in front of all the people. She refused, and she, it was off with her head, and then they had to find a new queen. And then 12... That's a problem when you <laughs> take the queen's head off. You always have to find a new one. <laughs> And 12 years later, he, he uh, elevates this uh, minister, Haman, to the highest position of the land. That happened, that happened 12 years later. And so Hashem, God orchestrated that even before the potential problem should be a solution in place, mm -hmm. that the queen, who was now Queen Esther, she was now very well uh, in the king's Perfectly town. positioned. For, for, exactly. So, and that's true for every part of the story of, of Purim. Because um, Esther is now the queen, so her uncle Mordechai hangs around the, the royal palace. And mm. because he's the head of the Supreme Court, he knows, understands all the languages, so he picks up on two uh, employees who want to uh, poison the king. He immediately alerts Esther, who alerts the king and saves his life. And when the king one evening couldn't sleep and he asked his uh, bedtime storytellers to read him a story of the Chronicles of the King, they read how Mordechai saved the king's life. And at that moment, um, so the, 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 they said there's nowhere in the book that sa where it says that they repaid Mordechai for his, uh, for his uh, favor. And at that moment, Haman comes knocking on the palace's door. He wants to consult with the king about hanging, Homa, hanging Mordechai. Right? And this happens right on the heels of Ahasuerus hearing about what Mordechai did to him. So everything happened in such a way that we clearly see it was orchestrated. By, so by when God. we say, for this title of the show, um, Purim Reconsidered, if you look at Purim from various different points of view, if you review the story and review the elements of the story, and if you compare the story to things that have happened in more recent times, there's a, there's a special quality about this. Exactly. So, um, tonight is Purim. Yes, so tonight is Purim. What's going to happen as far as Chabad is concerned? 
Well, we have a we have a, a Megillah reading. We read like like in your experience in Tel Aviv. We'll be reading the Megillah at the Temple at the Chabad House tonight. Everyone is invited, and uh, there'll be a lot of people there, hopefully. And it's always a, a very joyous time. And then afterwards, not, today is was called the Fast of Esther, uh, when Mordechai asked Esther to plead on, on behalf of the Jewish people, she said, okay, but uh, firstly, uh, she asked that Mordechai should let everyone know to fast. Fast is, fasting is one of the ways of we, penitence where we ask God for uh, his help. It's a way of uh, asking atonement. God for something. Yes. Or expressing atonement. Exactly. So, till today, the day before Purim is called the, the fast of Esther. So, uh, after the Megillah reading tonight, we break our fast. And then we have uh, uh, part, party number one. Uh, there's a very large Israeli community here in Hawaii, so they're going to come in and they're going to have a big party tonight at Chabad. And uh, they know how to party, these young Israeli kids. And then uh, tomorrow we have a big community uh, Purim party where people get dressed up and... Oh, sure, and the costumes. The costumes. Some are dressed as Esther, some as Mordecai. Some as Haman. Some as Haman, some as Akashveros. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, how about Vas Vashti, yes. Vashti, they dress up as Vashti, yeah, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Right, so, uh, but, but the message of, of Purim is a very, very powerful and very relevant message. And basically is that very often things in life, the way God set this world up, is things are hidden from from our view, we don't see, we don't see how what happened today uh, will help us with something potentially problem down the road. It's all connected. We're not able to connect the, the dots. Mm. The story of Purim is, 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 is like the Torah's perspective on the unfolding of events. Had someone lived through that time, they would not be able to connect the dots and, and, and see that uh, you know, that this party led to the Ashvashis being beheaded and needing a new queen and so that she can be there when Haman, all that kind of stuff. But rest assured, it's happening, and it's happening on a very, on a, on a, on a micro level as well as on a macro level. And, on, and on, on a historic level, I mean, in the sense that, I mean, we have a lot of history discussions here, and it's all connected. It's all a continuum. Right. And I suppose that, you know, at the historical level, that's, that's what Purim teaches us. Exactly. And what's interesting is, and frightening, or what's interesting is that uh, the modern-day Persia, which is Iran, is the only country in the world today that uh, loudly proclaims its aim to destroy the Jewish people, to destroy Israel. It's the now only let's country. Let's talk about that. You know, okay, so... How many years ago did the story of the Megillah happen? We 500 a, B.C. 500 B.C. Oh, wow. um, and so obviously there were issues for the Jews in those times. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, I suppose you could try to make the case that those issues have, have continued and been exacerbated because for some reason now here, 2019, uh, Iran is the, is the rogue of the whole neighborhood. The rogue is not, not only the rogue for Israel, but for other countries, too, making trouble. Um, it's, a, it's an advanced country in many ways. I mean, they can build nuclear reactors and this sort of thing, make bombs. But <clears throat> they're, they're not advanced socially. There's a lot of repression, a lot of um, you know, inappropriate punishment, right, but uh, also, human rights issues. Right, but also it's really almost all of the Jewish holidays uh, that we celebrate is, is the uh, clash of uh, different cultures or, uh, you know, right and wrong, good and evil, uh, these forces that still, uh, that still, uh, that we find today in the world today. And, uh, and uh, so this is a repeat. We haven't vanquished yeah. evil from this but, world But yet. studying Purim, yes. I mean, I'm just throwing yeah. this out for your yeah. consideration. Studying this Purim um, makes us perhaps more aware that there are some regimes that are repressive. There are so, some regimes that are unacceptable and doing unacceptable things, and we have to see them clearly for that. Exactly. We have to see, you know, Purim makes us see clearly what Iran, what Persia really is today. It's not a pretty picture. But you have to have the comparison. 
so you can see clearly. No? Right. Yes. Correct. And uh, and what's uh, frightening is that the, you know the modern day Iran has its roots way back in uh, in old Persia. And it's the same same story. Just they got to get over that already. Yeah, they should. Yeah, they should. Let me, let me but we have to mask. thank them because they gave us the most joyous holiday that we have on the calendar. <laughs> and, and that's uh, the story of our existence. They tried to kill us, God saved us, <laughs> and we're celebrating. Yeah, we're still around. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you. Great to see you here and talk to you. Great thank to you, have Jay. these discussions with you. Thank you. Happy Purim, everyone. Happy Purim, everyone. Aloha.